You're listening to Nest Talk, the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the internet. Now, here's your host, Christopher Linfont. Ladies and gentlemen of the Ravens flock, my name is Christopher Linfont, bringing you another episode of the Nest Talk podcast, the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the internet. Today is actually Thursday. I know I usually record on Friday mornings, but today is Thursday in the late evening, around 9.30 um, at night. And the reason for recording on Thursday is that I won't have time. I have something going on on Friday. So we will not have an episode recorded on Friday, but no worries. This is the weekly episode. It will be released on Friday anyway. And I wanted to make sure I waited to the night to make sure that in case there was any sort of news, we would not miss it. Uh, and frankly, there was not a lot of news today or this week. Um, Baltimore Ravens haven't really done much since they lost in Kansas City, and we'll talk about that, of course. But first, you know the business around here. We have to give some quick reminders to you all. If you are listening on iTunes or YouTube, make sure you subscribe there and give us comments, feedback there. Love the comments recently. Really, really love the engagement you guys are having in the comments, conversations, love taking part in those, uh, and that's really what this podcast is all about, bringing together Ravens fans for um, great Ravens conversations, and I just love to see it when we uh, have all those comments in, in, in the uh, under the video, and of course, reviews on iTunes as well, and of course, it helps me out, and it helps you out too. It can help um, create better content for you on a weekly basis, and that is what we are all about here at the Baltimore Feather, which reminds me, you should check out the Baltimore Feather, um, be, be at Be More Feather on Twitter. Of course, you can also find us on Facebook. Just search up Baltimore Feather on Facebook. Um, BaltimoreFeather.com for the latest and greatest Ravens news and opinion articles. Highly, highly, highly recommend that you go there and subscribe to the newsletter. That gives you all the latest Ravens news and opinion articles, which I will be pumping out more. I have had not enough time to do them recently, but as per our schedule, we will be pumping more out. I have three Ravens retrospective review articles, and those um, are essentially the film review articles, and they are basically ready to go at this point. Um, they haven't officially really been written yet, but I have all the data, basically, except for the second half of the Kansas City Chiefs game. I've been charting them all first, and I hadn't got around to the first two uh, weeks prior to the Chiefs, which is really... A very bad thing on my hand based on procrastination but we will get those out probably in the coming week uh, all three of them and then plus of course you've got the other Ravens retrospective review for the game that we haven't even hit yet the Cleveland Browns game this Sunday I will be there and I hope you will be there as well and of course we can you can find all the coverage um, on the Baltimore Feather uh, BaltimoreFeather.com at Be More Feather you can find Nest Talk at Nest Talk and you can find me at Chris Linfont on Twitter as well, and if you so happen to want to follow um, the Nest Talk podcast on Facebook, you can find us there just by searching up Nest Talk on Facebook as well. That pretty much wraps up the housekeeping information here. Um, there's not so much else to talk about, but we do have to go into the news. Um, again, I mentioned earlier that there wasn't a whole lot of Ravens news for this week, um, really. The Ravens, since beating the Chiefs, have not made any mon monumental trades regarding Jalen Ramsey. I'm sorry, everybody who's interested, and we'll talk about Ramsey, actually. Um, they haven't had any major injuries, which is a very good thing. And there's no major schematic changes, no major coaching changes, nothing really going on in Owings Mills, Maryland. Um, so what do we have to know going into this, this fourth week of the NFL regular season here? We're already basically a quarter of the way in. Um, to the regular season. What do we have to know about it? Well, I think we should always take a look at the Baltimore uh, Ravens here and their injury situation. It's always interesting and important to know who will be playing, who will not be playing. We don't know that yet. Um, they don't really in release that information until inactives hit to be official who's not going to play. Um, but we do know that there are specific players on the um, on 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 injury watch here that we've been give, be, been getting updates. I'm sorry, we've been getting updates for these players uh, all week, and based on Thursday's practice participation, we can kind of get 
a sense of what's going to happen. Now, Thursday's practice participation, we have Mark Andrews, the tight end, the prolific tight end, who didn't have a very good game against Kansas City, but he was banged up with that foot, did not participate in practice, but he did play last week, so that's a good sign for Ravens fans, and of course, there's fantasy owners out there, I know some of them, um, that's a good sign that he played last week. I would imagine he could play again. It's just whether or not the team is going to feel, you know, ready to push him through again. If it's gotten any worse, I don't know, but he didn't participate this Thursday. But again, he, he played last week after, after, um, it didn't, I don't think he got re-injured. Um, Jimmy Smith did not participate. This is obvious. The MCL sprain he's coming off of um, he won't be participating in practice or games for quite a long time. Well, not quite a long time, but a few weeks at most here since that MCL sprain occurred. Earl Thomas, there's a bit of an injury scare with him this past week, but he is a full participant, was a full participant in Thursday's practice. So there's really no concern about Earl Thomas heading into Sunday here. Brendan Trawick is a guy a lot of people want back immediately based on the Ravens' secondary performance, and we'll talk about that in this episode as well. Um, Trawick is not had did not practice on Thursday. That basically means um, he is. <laughs> I mean, look, it's possible he'll play. He got injured on that punt return um, in Ari- against the Arizona Cardinals, but I kind of doubt it. I'm not going to say he's going to miss this game, but I really don't anticipate him playing especially since he hasn't practiced. I mean, really only because he hasn't practiced. If he had been limited in, in practice, I said I would say there's a chance, but he hasn't practiced in about two weeks. As a special teams player, you can get somebody else to fill in his shoes maybe. Not to the caliber he can, but at least fill out the motions of what he can do. Um, but Trawick has not practiced since last week, since before the, the, the Cardinals game, uh, and he did not participate in practice on Thursday as well, which is the day this is being recorded. Uh, Marlon Humphrey is limited in practice, and this is extremely important that he plays because we all know the Ravens secondary had a massive failure against Kansas City. They cannot afford to lose Marlon Humphrey again. Um, I don't exactly remember what his injury was. I believe it was a lower body injury. I'm not exactly sure, but Marlon Humphrey is limited in practice, which means he's, he's on the verge of playing, but we don't know. I mean... I can't rule him out, and I can't rule him in. I'm going to rule Earl Thomas in because he's a full participant. I don't know why he wouldn't practice after being a full part. I mean, play after being a full participant in practice. Marlon Humphrey, on the other hand, it, it's very shaky. You can't really predict him to do either. It's really a, a coin toss at this point, in my opinion. Um, I hope he plays, but I won't say I expect him to play. I don't know what Harbaugh is thinking. I don't know what the doctors are telling Harbaugh right now about Marlon Humphrey. We will just have to wait and see on um, Humphrey. He's probably going to be a game day decision, I would imagine. We won't find out, again, until the inactives list comes out on Sunday. Um, and if the Ravens really need him and he's 90% ready, I would imagine they'd play him. But if he has any sort of hindrance, any possibility of getting re-injured, it might be best to sit him, even though this is an extremely important game against a rival team you got to have him for the year. You don't want to risk him against the Browns now because you're going to play him again. You don't want to risk him now. But we, we do hope, he. The, the hope is that he will play on Sunday and assist this Ravens secondary that badly needs the help. Uh, final injury um, injury watch player here is Otero Alaka, the former undrafted rookie here um, from preseason, made the, made, the, made the roster out of camp um, as an undrafted rookie. The problem for Otero Laka, he wasn't going to play anyway, so he would have probably been inactive. I mean, he does do well on special teams, but he's not a huge player on this Ravens defense and really not a huge player on the Ravens special teams unless he was going to fill in for Brendan Trawick, um, which I don't know if he would have. So it's not a super major loss for the Ravens that miss Otero Alaka this game. I mean, it is important for depth here because the Ravens, even the linebackers had, well, of course the linebackers had problems covering, but it, it was all out, I don't even know a word to say, it was an all out disaster for the Ravens secondary, for the Ravens passing defense on Sunday against the Kansas City Chiefs. Any sort of help would have would be 
very appreciative. Um, but Otero Alaka won't be the one to help because he's not going to play. I really highly doubt he'd be active um, even if he was healthy because this is a big game. They have other guys they need to squeeze in. If Marlon Humphrey can't go, if Brenda Trawa can't go, if Mark Andrews can't go, they're going to have to squeeze in other players on this roster um, come Sunday in order to basically give them a chance to beat the Browns at home. And I think they're going to have a good chance to beat the Browns. But, you know, if they put Otero Alaka in instead of Maurice Kennedy in the secondary, and Maurice Kennedy isn't, I'm not saying Maurice Kennedy is very good, okay? No offense to Maurice Kennedy, but he can't cover a brick wall. Um, Otero Alaka isn't going to be the guy you're going to put in over him just based on depth position alone with the secondary hurting so much. So I would imagine he wouldn't play even if he was healthy, um, but I could be wrong, of course. Um, but we'll see what happens with him. Um, heading into Sunday, but again, I do not expect him to be active on Sunday based on his practice participation record for this past week. Uh, moving on to the next piece of Ravens news, and the second, you know, the second piece of news here is the only other piece of news we've got, and that's what Shannon Sharp has said recently. Now, if you don't watch Undisputed with Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless, honestly, welcome to the club because I don't watch it very much either, but I do pay attention to what these guys say because. First of all, Skip Bayless is very entertaining. I don't agree with basically anything he ever says, but he's very entertaining. Shannon Sharp, on the other hand, seems to know more about football than than Skip Bayless. I don't think anybody's going to argue with me on that. It's the same dynamic with um, you know Stephen A. And, and the football analyst that he has on. Stephen A. is a great um, personality, but he's really not a football guy. He's more of an NBA guy. I don't know what Skip Bayless is. I mean, he just talks... All day long, it doesn't really say much of anything. But he and Shannon Sharp had a discussion, and the discussion was: if you had a quarterback decision to make, you have a franchise, right, coming from the ground up. Which young quarterback do you decide to build that franchise around? What quarterback? And Shannon Sharp, honestly, somewhat surprisingly to me said Lamar Jackson because he didn't see Lamar Jackson's um, he did not anticipate Lamar Jackson's improvement which I mean no one really did the upside with Lamar is amazing he was talking about how in college Lamar Jackson didn't have mega weapons and did very well and now he's getting mega weapons and can do even better which is a point I never actually really thought about it never occurred to me to think that way. And he does have a point here, Shannon Sharp. Lamar Jackson never had elite receivers as a quarterback at Louisville. He wasn't the most accurate passer, but he didn't have guys that were going to, you know, go up and make catches a lot. I mean, Jalen Smith was an okay receiver he had. Had a good connection with him, but he's not dominant. I don't even think he's in the NFL right now. Did he make a practice squad? I don't remember. I don't think he did. He, does, he never had excellent receivers. Now here in Baltimore, he's got Marquise Hollywood Brown, perhaps the best rookie receiver, maybe. I mean, there's Terry McLaurin, too. Um, but I really think Marquise Brown could be in the running for Offensive Rookie of the Year. He's got Willie Sneed, who is a solid slot receiver. Not the best in the league, not the worst. But he's above average. He's got Miles Boykin, who has a lot of promise, has yet to show much of anything. He had one good play this, the first three weeks, and it was in Miami, and you know everybody had a good play that day, that day. But he's got a lot of promise. He's got Mark Andrews, perhaps the best tight end in the league right now. I mean, I'm not going to say it, but some people are saying Mark Andrews is the best tight end in the league. Looks like Jimmy Graham out there. A young Jimmy Graham, a Saints Jimmy Graham, that is. Um, then you've also got Hayden Hurst in this mix, too. You can't forget about Hayden Hurst. I've been watching a lot of film recently, and Hayden, Hayden Hurst has been filling in tight end, fullback, blocker, receiver. He's really getting all over the field, and he's getting more work than I think a lot of fans are realizing, more than I realized before I went back into this film review. Um, He's also got Nick Boyle, who is not to be laughed at, because Nick Boyle, I know he's a blocker. He's a guy who's going to pound um, somebody's face off, but 
you know, Nick Boyle is a viable target in, in, in the passing game as well. He's not just a blocker. He's not just a hard hitter. He can catch a ball and haul it in over a defender if he has to. And we've seen him get open. He hasn't get, got a touchdown yet, but that's going to change eventually. You know, it's not a specialty to catch the football, but he can do it without a question. So you have an offense with receivers that are and targets that Lamar can actually throw to, and they're very differing receivers. I mean, Marquise Brown is the speedster. Willie Sneed's a possession guy. Miles Boykin is supposedly a jump ball guy. Seth Roberts does well. Um, you know, I'm forgetting somebody, obviously. Uh, but then you've got, look, you've got Mark Andrews, who I think is, is the best receiver on the team. Hayden Hurst, who can, who can, is really a Swiss Army knife for us. Nick Boyle, blocker, excellent, helps him in the running game, but can receive as well. Now, the running game, you have to complement with Lamar. And that's what the Ravens have done. And this is where Shannon Sharp, um, his thinking, his logic, is actually very, very good because the way Lamar runs the ball, you need guys who complement him. And the Ravens have done exactly that. And, and, and it's showing because the Ravens right now have the number one offense in the league. As crazy as that sounds, the Baltimore Ravens have the number one offense in the National Football League. They have the number 16 defense, which just got to come up. That's not Ravens-like. But they have the number one offense, which is insane. They average about 500 yards per game right now. And it's only been three games, I know. But that's crazy to think about. So anyway, to complement Lamar Jackson, you need north-south runners and a speed back. Well, guess what? Mark Andrews, north-south runner. Gus Edwards, north-south runner. Justice Hill, speed back. You have a system in place where you could conceivably have Lamar Jackson at quarterback, Gus Edwards, and Mark Ingram in an I formation or something behind Lamar Jackson and Justice Hill on his side, you can have like a triple read option. Okay, defenses won't know what's coming at them. And they're not going that super complex, but they're making complex plays in the running game where Lamar Jackson has the decision. These are no longer read options, by the way. These are RPOs now. That's what the Ravens are doing here. They're giving Lamar Jackson the option to run and pass in certain situations. Not a lot, but in certain situations. And of course, you also have those read options where he has the read, and it's going to be a run anyway. But the way Lamar is doing this, the way Lamar is progressing through this offense that is, again, it's tailored around him, so, you know, he can't just plug and play into every team in the league. But it's astonishing. And Shannon Sharp is right. If you want to build a team off of any quarterback right now, it's got to be Lamar Jackson because it's really kind of easy to build around him. You don't need... I mean, no offense to Flacco, but Flacco needed receivers because Flacco couldn't run. Pat Mahomes needs some decent receivers. He doesn't have to have the best receivers. But he's got to have decent guys who can catch the ball 90% of the time in contested situations. He's got Sammy Watkins, Tyreek Hill. You know, these are guys that can do it. Lamar Jackson doesn't necessarily need that. He needs guys that can get open and catch a ball in open space because no one is going to cover them super tightly when he takes off on a bootleg. Guys are going to come up. Things are going to get spaced out. He has to just deliver it. So as long as you have guys that can beat matchups, like Marquise Brown going deep, like Miles Boykin jumping over some guy, like Willie Sneed in the slot, like Mark Andrews basically just demolishing people, Hayden Hurst, Swiss Army Knife kind of thing, Justice Hill out of the backfield, even Mark Ingram out of the backfield has done well. As long as you can find matchups that these offensive players around Jackson can win, then Lamar Jackson is going to be a very good quarterback. And that's what's being proven. I mean, you asked me this last year, I would have told you, well, you know, Lamar is not a very good quarterback. I don't know if he's going to get to that point. It's a wait and see prospect. Waiting and seeing, we're done with that. Lamar has gotten to the point where we don't need to wait and see anymore. We now know what he can do and we know He can be one of the best quarterbacks in this league. It's flat out true. And to the people that are still questioning Lamar Jackson here, I mean, I get it. It's it's difficult to think that a mobile quarterback like this, I mean, with so many accuracy issues coming out of college, 
is going to be the pastor that we need. I understand. I, I, I felt the same way last year. I didn't see it last year. But the tape doesn't lie. What we're seeing on the tape this year is radically different, and it's allowing Lamar Jackson to become the best young quarterback in the NFL. That's not named Pat Mahomes. I'm sorry, but, you know, it's Pat Mahomes. I, he's not, Lamar Jackson's not Pat Mahomes right now. Maybe he will be one day, but he's not that level right now. I would absolutely build a franchise around Lamar Jackson with what we know now. I'm not going to apologize for what I said, you know, in the draft, thinking he was not a very good quarterback in the draft because that's what I thought. The evidence in that draft class, from that draft tape, from the college tape, we didn't have a good situation, you know, we didn't have a good understanding that Lamar Jackson could become this. We didn't know. Now we know. Now we full on know. It's very obvious. And if you are still doubting, just. Go get yourself a free trial of the NFL Game Pass and watch him in film. It's masterful. Not so much in the first half of the Kansas City game, and we'll talk about that. But the way he plays the game, when he's on, he is on. And Shannon Sharp is 100% right. Lamar Jackson is the quarterback you want to build a franchise around right now, without a doubt. Okay. So that was kind of more opinion, but whatever. doesn't matter. We're going into opinion anyway now. Uh, we've got some topics here to cover today, and the first is, why is the secondary struggling? And what can the Ravens do to improve that secondary? Heading in to week four and beyond here, it's a very important topic that has to be covered by somebody in Owings Mills because, frankly, um, a struggling secondary is not going to win a lot of games. Period. 2015, the Ravens had a terrible secondary. How many games did we win in 2015? Everybody got hurt in 2015, but let me remind you that almost all of the games were within a possession. There were so many games that were so close. And at the end of the day, whether it was the offense or the defense that couldn't do it, didn't matter because the entire team was just so close but so far. But the secondary was obviously the weakest link. A better secondary would probably would have won a lot more games. Maybe we don't go 5-11, maybe we go 8-8, eight 9-7, eight, who knows? But we don't lose all those games. 2016, not a very good secondary either. Had some good players, Tavon Young coming out, Jimmy Smith, Eric Weddle coming in. Not a very great secondary. But 2017, 2017 things changed. Jimmy Smith went bonanzas. You got Brandon Carr in there, Marlon Humphrey in his rookie year, Eric Weddle, Tony Jefferson in there. That secondary was full of ballers. And a lot of those guys are still here. And Jimmy Smith was perhaps one of the best corners in the game. It was a lockdown secondary. The defense was ecstatic. We should have went to the playoffs that year. Jimmy Smith got hurt, and look what happened at the end of the year. No Jimmy Smith. Jimmy Smith is hurt. Look what happened. I don't know who was on the coverage on Tyler Boyd. I'm not going to point fingers because I don't remember. But that's what happens when your secondary breaks down. And frankly, it's what's happening right now. The Ravens secondary is breaking down. Jimmy Smith is hurt. Tavon Young is hurt. These are two of our best players. Tavon Young is an excellent slot cornerback, perhaps the best slot corner in the game right now. Jimmy Smith, I know I suggest the Ravens at least inquire in trading him over this past summer. The inquiry, there's no reason to now because we obviously know that without Smith, we're not we're not doing well. Because Jimmy Smith being injured, I mean, the, the Dolphins didn't do anything against us. The Dolphins sucked. But you have the Cardinals, right? Kyler Murray put up like, what was it, almost 400 yards passing, somewhere around there. Unbelievable numbers. Pat Mahomes, you expect him to pass well, but... He had unbelievable numbers as well. And you can't live like this. You can't live with this secondary and expect to win too many games. Now, I know the Ravens' offense is, is basically going to carry them for a little bit for the foreseeable future here, but when we go up against big-time opponents like the Chiefs, you're going to need a secondary that can compete. And this secondary right now isn't competing. And again, Jimmy Smith is injured. There's no Tavon Young in there. He's out injured. That's the crux of the problem. 
the guys who are filling in for Jimmy Smith and Tavon Young, they're not too good. I hate to say it, but they're not too good. I had so much hype for Anthony Averett, Anthony Averett this summer. In the preseason, he didn't look that good. I was disappointed, but I thought to myself, it's the preseason. He'll get better. He's still an Alabama defensive back. He fits this system. He's a guy a lot of teams would be lucky to have. But now it feels like every time there's a broken coverage, it's number 34. It's Anthony Averett. Or his counterpart, who might just be as bad as him. And I'm not trying to be mean, but Maurice Kennedy can't cover a brick wall. It's just true. I don't understand why the secondary is breaking down the way it is. Because on paper, Kennedy and Averett shouldn't be this bad. I don't know why they're struggling. Kennedy was never the best player, okay? But this is his fourth year in Baltimore, and he should at least have improved from his rookie year. He's had one good play his entire stint with the Ravens, and that was against the Colts when he knocked down the pass to keep the Ravens' playoff hopes alive. And the next week, the secondary, and I don't know if it was him. I think, I don't know. But the secondary the next week gave it all up. Then you got Anthony Averett here again. This is his second year now, and he's not really improved. I know it's difficult to be thrust into the position he is with, without Jimmy Smith, without Tavon Young, but, I mean, seriously, Cyrus Jones looks better than him. And Cyrus Jones barely plays corner. Cyrus Jones is on this team to be a punt returner, and he looks better than Anthony Averett and Maurice Kennedy. That's not good. That's not acceptable. And of course, it's Earl Thomas' disappointing play. I mean, Earl Thomas has not been bad, but he's not been the dominant force that we know Earl Thomas can be. Where, How many times have you been impressed with Earl Thomas this season? Don't lie. Don't lie to me. How many times have you watched the play and go, ooh, Earl Thomas, that's why we paid him big bucks. I, I got one, and it was against the Dolphins. It was that pick. That's the only one this entire season I've said to myself, whoa, that's the old Thomas I want. I mean, maybe they're just not throwing towards him because they're afraid of him. Maybe because of the other weaknesses in the secondary, they can exploit that and know that Earl Thomas isn't going to help, isn't going to be able to do anything. I don't know. I'm not watching his, his the amount of times he's being thrown to. I probably should, but I'm not. But he hasn't been in the areas he has to be. And even if that's true, even if the Chiefs and the Cardinals are saying, look, don't throw to Earl Thomas, don't throw Earl Thomas' way, he still would have had to deal with that in in Seattle and and did much better than this. I mean, maybe it's the first few weeks with a new team and it'll get it all together. But it is disappointing. And again, it's not been bad play by any stretch of the imagination. It just doesn't feel like the Earl Thomas that we know of, that we, we signed. It's not that Earl Thomas in that uniform on that field playing free safety. It's not. It doesn't look like him at all. So we'll have to see him improve. And what should the Ravens do? I mean, you got two two things you have have to do here. Well, one thing you have to do, and second thing you can do. The first thing is you're going to have to wait it out. Because, look, Jimmy Smith eventually is going to come back. Tavon's not coming back for the year. But Earl Thomas should eventually kind of get things rolling in this new system um, and really start to dominate at free safety. Then you can either demote Maurice Kennedy, bench Anthony Averett, whatever, when Jimmy Smith comes back. Whatever. Um, And hopefully Brandon Carr, I mean, Brandon Carr is like the only guy out there who's been stable. I mean, he's not great, Brandon Carr, but he's going to get the job done. Um, and I, I would say Marlon Humphrey is a stable cornerback too, but we don't know if he's going to play right now. So it's a sticky situation. But the second thing the Ravens can do, this is what they can do now, not what they have to do, but what they can do, is trade for Jalen Ramsey. The Jalen Ramsey, the news, the word on the block for Jalen Ramsey. He is not exactly sure what's going to happen to him. Doesn't know if the Jaguars are going to keep him. Doesn't know if they're going to trade him. 
All he knows is that his wife is giving birth, I think, in Nashville, and he had to leave team facilities. I mean, I get that. That's obvious. Go do that. But the whole situation is just bizarre with Jalen Ramsey. He gets trade. He wants to be traded, gets banged up, gets sick, birth of his new son or daughter, doesn't know whether he's getting traded, doesn't know if he's going to play for the Jaguars again. I mean, it's been so long since he demanded a trade. It's been like two weeks now. I'm starting to think he's not leaving Jacksonville. I think that the Jags are going to hold on to him somehow. Um, And maybe the asking price is just too high. And they're doing it on purpose, I would imagine, because they don't want to lose Jalen Ramsey. In a year, they can still win the division. They're one and two. I mean, Gardner Minshew looks good. Just because Nick Foles is gone doesn't mean you have to give up the entire season here. So Jalen Ramsey may actually stay in Jacksonville, but the Ravens can still pry him out of Doug Marone's hands and, of course, Tom Coughlin down there as well. But is the price too steep? And there's a lot of debate in the Ravens' flock right now about what price is too much to pay for Jalen Ramsey. What is the price that you would not go past? What would you not spend over on Ramsey? The Jaguars reportedly want two first-round picks. Not happening. No. Nuh-uh. Not for a guy who could leave in a couple years on his contract. He'd be up next year. After next year, I believe. I'm not paying two first-round picks for Jalen Ramsey. No. Definitely not. A first-round pick and Hayden Hurst? Maybe. Although I am liking Hayden Hurst more than I was last week when I talked about this issue. The price has got to be going down because he hasn't been traded yet. Unless they're just keeping it artificially high so they can't make a trade. I don't know. And there's not other corners you can really trade for right now. I mean, Mink, Minka Fitzpatrick is out from the Dolphins. No one else is really on the market. If you got Jalen Ramsey, though, the secondary on paper would explode once Jimmy Smith comes back. Jimmy Smith, Jalen Ramsey, Brandon Carr, Marlon Humphrey, Earl Thomas, Tony Jefferson... That's Legion of Boom times 12, okay? You don't need a 12th man to help you on that one. So, should the Ravens, though? I mean, would he even fit in Baltimore? Would he mesh well with Harbaugh? These are questions I can't answer. I don't know what what Harbaugh would be able to do with Jalen Ramsey. Jalen Ramsey can be kind of crazy. Jalen Ramsey can be a distraction, a locker room issue. These are not, you know, hidden things. These are not... Things we don't know about Jalen Ramsey we know can be a locker room problem. But would Harbaugh be able to put up with it? Would he be able to control him? If he can, then we can't take him. But if he can, maybe. And it's all in the mind of Eric DaCosta here. It's all up to Eric DaCosta's mind. That's the ultimate decider on this. If the Jaguars come down to the right price for the Ravens, whether to do it or not. I really don't know what to say, whether or not I agree that he should be traded for, or whether we should just leave him out there in Jacksonville and not even pick him up. It's tough because we don't know what we don't know what would get the deal done, and we don't know how we would fit with this Ravens team. So I'm taking a wait and see approach, and hopefully Jimmy Smith can go back soon and fix his secondary, because we do not want another 2014 on our hands when the secondary. I mean, I didn't even talk about 2014 when I was rambling on earlier about this years with bad secondaries, but. You tell me how many cornerbacks you remember from the 2014 season. Aside from Jimmy Smith, I mean, Melvin, right? Wasn't it Rashad Melvin we had in there? Somebody else? I mean, it was bad. And we had, remember, remember this, two, two, two touchdown leads. That's two 14-point games on the Patriots in the playoffs, and we still lost. Why? Why? Because the secondary was bad. It couldn't hold the leads against Brady and, of course, the Edelman play and the stupid play calling that Belichick did that then got banned after that game. Whatever. The point is, bad secondaries undermine the team. Something has to be done about this if the Ravens want to compete for a Super Bowl. I don't know what it is. It could be just waited out and hope Jimmy Smith fix it. It could be trade for Jalen Ramsey. That's not my decision. I'm not going to weigh in on it because, I frankly, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do if I'm Eric DaCosta. Let me know what you think, though. I want to know 
Trade for Jalen Ramsey? Don't trade for Jalen Ramsey. We had this conversation last week, but based on what we saw in Kansas City, I need to know now, has anybody's opinion changed based on what they said last week? I'm really interested to hear that. Speaking of Kansas City, um, the Ravens lost, obviously. And it, it you have to, I mean, take it with a grain of salt because it's Kansas City. They weren't supposed to win this game. But I was really hyped up for this game. I thought for sure that the Baltimore Ravens were going to win this game. Spoiler alert, again, they didn't win. Um, and the reason for that really is dumb decisions. More than anything else, it's dumb decisions. If you read my piece after the game, I was very disappointed with what Harbaugh did. And I know the analytics said go for two points when you're down... 11 to make it a nine point game so that way your percentage from winning would go up from from potentially seven with the extra point to 11 percent but i mean strategy wise that doesn't make any sense you tell me why you would even want to risk that to make it risk making an 11 point game for a nine point game doesn't make any sense because all the Ravens had to do would be score a touchdown and kick a field goal and they'd be tied. They could have went for the two-point on the touchdown later. If they want to win the game on a two-point conversion, fine. Go for it. But why are we doing it now? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Why go for the two-point there, right, to make it a nine-point game, which is still a two-possession game, when you could have had it a ten-point game, so it would have been a field goal and a touchdown tie it. And I get it. A field goal and a touchdown would have won it. But missing it makes it a field goal and an extra point or needed to tie, a two-point conversion or needed to tie the game. When you could have had it be a field goal and a touchdown with the two-point conversion win the game at the end. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't think it makes sense to much people either. And Harbaugh was... I've never seen Harbaugh uptight like that. But he was uptight. Every question... He's like, you know, just short, quick answers. It was the analytics, all the analytics. I was following the analytics. The analytics people told me to do this. Then he was like, you know, well, when you write your articles, you know, criticizing me, just know that this was the decision that the analytics favored and that we're always going to be aggressive. Like, he was very uptight with reporters after the game. And he wasn't mean, but he, he was, you could tell, he was annoyed. Maybe at the at the fault of the play design. I don't know why he was so annoyed. But, you know, just came off of a loss. And the Ravens frankly lost. Not because of the dumb decisions. But it was the biggest factor. And I get going for it on fourth and two on your on in Kansas City's six yard line. I get that. And I can kind of understand where you're coming from when the balls move to the one yard line to go for two. But the ridiculous amount of aggressiveness by Harbaugh in deciding to go for fourth down conversions, for two point conversions, here, there, and everywhere, made absolutely no sense. And it hurt the Ravens, gravely hurt the Ravens. How are you going to come back from Lamar Jackson's poor play? Frankly, Lamar Jackson had a bad game in the first half. He performed poorly. The mistakes made from those aggressive play calls that you couldn't, you could have punted the ball away to the six yard line, right? To their six. Having them start on their six instead of our 40 or whatever it was. You're just giving points away. And every time the Ravens failed one of these ridiculous gimmick plays, the Chiefs came right back and just turned the table. The two-point conversion fails. They go down, score a touchdown, take the lead instead of tying it. Fourth down conversion fails. They go to score a touchdown. Two-point conversion fails here. They score a touchdown there. Which is over and over and over again. And you just felt like the Ravens were being overly aggressive for the point of being overly aggressive. And I get it. You don't want to play a field position battle with Pat Mahomes. It's not ideal. But what choice do you have? When your offense is struggling in the first half to do anything, 
Lamar Jackson didn't complete a pass to a receiver till sometime in the second quarter, if I remember correctly. He only passed the tight ends and, and running backs. And the Chiefs saw it. I mean, he passed to receivers. Marquise Brown got like four targets, all went incomplete before he, he caught a ball. But it was extremely poor play by Lamar Jackson. Extremely poor in the second, first half. Second half, it was much better. First half was bad. And those mistakes made on those dumb decisions just amplified the problems. The Ravens were not capitalizing on situations. They were not allowing the defense really good field position against Pat Mahomes. And maybe you can't play a field position game against Pat Mahomes. But when you're not converting on those plays like that, when you're being overly aggressive, you're not going to win either. Plain and simple. Uh, And of course, the secondary got torched. That's obvious. The secondary was just dreadful this game. I mean, Brandon Carr was, I mean, really the only guy out there that was being productive. And he wasn't great. He was good enough. He had some good plays. He had some plays that were decent. I don't really think he got burned at any point. But no Jimmy Smith. Marlon Humphrey went out at some at point in the game. He came back, if I believe, uh, if, if I remember correctly. Earl Thomas seemed invisible. Nowhere. I mean, Tony Jefferson, I think, missed a couple tackles. Anthony Averett looked poor. And Maurice Kennedy looked like, you know, a guy they found on the street before the game. I mean, there was a few plays that just highlight the really unpreparedness of these young players in secondary. And it's, I mean, it's somewhat excusable because Anthony Averett wasn't supposed to be thrust into this position. Maurice Kennedy, though, I mean, has to improve. He has to. I mean, I feel bad for him because he has so much potential, he's just not improving. But Anthony Averett was, what, their first drive of the game? Kansas City's first drive or whatever? Second drive, something like that. Sammy Watkins fumbles the ball. And Anthony Averett's right there to get it. And, you know, what does he do? He slides down to get it. Oh, smart decision. Except he slides too late and goes over top the football. Easy turnover. Went over top the football. And Sammy Watkins just took it back. It was an easy turnover. That's all he had to do was get the football. He couldn't even do that. It was on the ground. It wasn't moving. He slid over top it. And, of course, the reaction on, on social media and, and Raven circles everywhere was like, how on earth could you do that? I'm not going to be the, the guy that pretends that he can get on the football field and do what Anthony Everett does. But let me tell you something. I could slide into a football. Okay, I can slide into a football. Anthony Everett didn't slide into the football. I don't know why, but he didn't. He went over top of it. All he had to do was just go down and get it. But he slid right over top of it. It was insane. And then, of course, there's the play. What was it? The 83-yard touchdown on Mecole Hardman? Ridiculously bad play by the Ravens secondary. The ex- explanation was that there was a, a misunderstanding in coverage. Can you guess which player looked like he misunderstood? And I don't know officially. Maybe it was Earl Thomas who was, was supposed to get the safety help up top. But Maurice Kennedy let Mecole Hardman walk right past him. Didn't do a darn thing about it. And Miko Harmon went right into the end zone. Maybe Earl Thomas, maybe Tony Jefferson, somebody was supposed to come up and give him safety help. I don't know. But Harbaugh said a player misread that. And the closest player to Miko Harmon at the start of the play was, was, was Maurice Kennedy. So in my mind, I think Maurice Kennedy just forgot the play. I think that's what happened. And that's... If that's true, and I can't prove it, it's completely unacceptable if it's true. He didn't have a good game, Maurice Kennedy, at all. Not a good game. And it's we don't expect him to. I'm not trying to be mean to Maurice Kennedy here, but it's really disappointing every time he gets an opportunity. He just can't get it together. And I want to see him succeed, but it's not happening. But then again, he is better than, than some of these other guys on other teams that, you know, can't can't do anything in the secondary. At least Maurice Kennedy has some good plays. As a relief guy, it is, sometimes there's just not much more you can ask for. So the secondary got torched, and that's really the reason. Um, the, all three of those reasons. Dumb decisions, poor play by Lamar Jackson in the first half. Secondary got torched. Those are the reasons the Ravens lost. 
Mark Ingram had a field day. It wasn't the running game. I mean, Gus Edwards even did well. If if Willie Sneed didn't get that bogus holding call, and it was bogus, okay? It wasn't holding. He was blocking. He wasn't holding. He was blocking. The ref just threw it because the guy got because Gus Edwards went for 45 yards and he just assumed Willie Sneed was holding. That's what happened. If that was kept, I mean, there's just so many runs. The running game was, was fine. But the passing game is what shot this Ravens offense in the foot. The dumb decision shot the Ravens defense in the foot, and the secondary was just on fire because it got torched. That's it. And, you know, we have to move on from Kansas City. we got to go on to Cleveland now because Cleveland, this is the important game of the first quarter of the season here. You've got to win against your division rivals, and especially when the Cleveland Browns are coming in 1-2 and two to a hostile environment. The rest of the AFC North is struggling beyond belief. I mean, Pittsburgh looks atrocious. And the Bengals, I mean, they're the Bengals. What do you expect? Um, Cleveland is really the only team here that's going to contest the Ravens for this division crown. And if you can get this win, push them down to 1-3, and three, yourself to 3-1 and one early, and then, you know, have the chance to sweep them later on, perfect start to the year. I don't care you lost in Kansas City. That's a perfect start to the year in my books. When you're two whole games ahead and have the potential to get a tiebreaker, perfect. Don't want it any other way. So what do the Ravens need to do to win this game? Well, you'll find that out on preview and predictions this Saturday. But players to watch. I'll give you the players to watch. The first player, Odell Beckham Jr. And, and, you know, it's easy to say OBJ is going to be the X Factor. Not really talking like that. I'm saying here, this offense for Cleveland has struggled. They've only really done well against um, the Jets. They had a couple good plays against the Rams. Not enough. They didn't score enough points to beat the Rams. They didn't score enough points to beat the Titans in the beginning of the year, which is hilarious. Um, But they need one of their playmakers to emerge here and start to dominate. And if it's going to be anybody, it's going to be Odell Beckham because we've seen what he did against the Ravens in 2016. When he played for the for the New York Giants in 2016, he was the X factor in that game. I mean, yeah, he was the X factor. He was the guy that won the Giants the game on that slant play that took him to the house to win the game. He was the basically the entire offense. And if anybody's going to be able to push through this Ravens offense and crack the ice that's surrounding the Cleveland Browns offense, it's going to be Odell Beckham Jr. Especially, especially with a with a secondary. That is unstable as the Ravens are right now. I mean, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom here, but Odo Beckham, Jarvis Landry uh, against banged up Marlon Humphrey and Brandon Carr. It's not terrible, but once they once they're able to get up against Anthony Averett and Maurice Kennedy, it's not going to be good. It's it won't be good there if they can get into a zone coverage there. And, you know, Jarvis Landry could be the guy you say is going to be the X factor. He's going to be the guy maybe that, you know, defrosts this offense. But I think it's going to be Odo Beckham based on what we've seen out of him in the past. Jarvis Landry isn't really as electrifying as Odell. He's a very good receiver, Jarvis Landry. But he's not Odo Beckham Jr. Doesn't have the speed, the size, the athletic ability Odell does. He's a complete different monster. And the Ravens will have to be able not to bottle him up, not to control him but to defend him well enough where he can't take over the game and create a situation like what happened in 2016 where he single-handedly won the Giants the game. Period. That's it. That's what they've got to do. Next player to watch, Miles Miles Garrett. Obviously, Miles Garrett. The Ravens' offensive line has actually looked pretty darn good, and it's somewhat surprising, but somewhat not surprising at the same time. The tackles you knew were going to be good, Stanley and... Uh, Orlando Brown, but I will say about the tackles, too many flags on them each. Orlando Brown a little bit more, I think, than Ronnie Stanley, but they've had a lot of penalties. Um, The interior, though, looks better than I thought it was going to be. Bradley Bozeman's doing a good job. Bradley Bozeman, I didn't think was going to start left tackle. I didn't even know he was, I'm sorry, left guard. I didn't even know he was in the competition until like the last week. And here he is doing super well at it. Um... Marshall Yonda is always going to be good. I mean, he probably will slow down by the end of this year, but right now he's fine. And Matt Skura is doing fine at center. 
if you look at that play in Kansas City when Mark Ingram walked through the defensive line into the end zone, the first touchdown, it was, I think, Bradley Bozeman and, and uh, maybe Yana was in there too as a swing guard, but Scarra, they just part of the Red Sea, and that was it. Ingram walked in, and this is the play we need from this offensive line. And against Miles Garrett, it's going to be difficult because they really haven't gone up against an elite pass rusher. There's no elite pass rusher on um, the Miami Dolphins. They had Frank Clark, who I think they gave up a sack to in Kansas City. The Cardinals don't really have an elite pass rusher. I mean, Chandler Jones is okay. Terrell Suggs is... I mean, he's Terrell Suggs. He's, he's good, but he's not what he used to be. Miles Garrett, he's young. He's fast. He's on a defense that wants revenge. This is going to be a guy that, you know, could be a problem for the Ravens if they're not prepared. I think they can prepare, but if they're not prepared, they're, he's going to wreak havoc. They have to be ready to send whoever against him, whether it's Ronnie Stanley he lines up against or it's Orlando Brown or he tries to go interior. Those guys all have to be ready for what Miles Garrett can do. And the final player to watch here is Baker Mayfield. Yes, that Baker Mayfield, the guy who is under... A lot of heat right now. Because if you look at the way he's playing, he's not playing well. I'm sorry, he's not playing well. He's not the Baker Mayfield we saw last year. Far from it. I don't know what's happening. And I'm disappointed because I like Baker Mayfield, okay? I know he's on the rival team, but I've liked him since he was at Oklahoma. I liked him before he won the Heisman. He's a guy I root for. And, you know... I'm not going to root for him on Sunday. I'm not going to root for him when it counts putting the Ravens away. But he's a guy, I think, that has a lot of talent. A lot to prove, of course. But he's somebody who's just fun to watch, too. And last year was fun to watch. When he wasn't playing the Ravens, he was fun to watch. But now, I mean, he's not good right now. He's just not good right now. He's not having the success he had last year. For whatever reason, he's not. And he's going to look at this Raven secondary and his offensive weapons and say to himself, you got to get it together this game. You have to. It's excusable when you can't beat an elite team like the Rams. It's not excusable when you can't beat the Titans. And they have an okay secondary. But now you're coming in against the Ravens with an opportunity to win against a banged up secondary that's going to have problems. Baker needs to take advantage of it. And the Ravens have to be ready for what Baker can do. He's going to roll out a lot, obviously. He's going to try to make plays on his feet before he throws. He's going to look for Odo Beckham, Jarvis Landry. He's going to give it off to Nick Chubb a lot. We understand the game plan. It's just, will this Raven secondary be ready to handle Baker Mayfield? And if they're not, they're going to regret it. They're going to lose if they don't handle Baker Mayfield. If Baker Mayfield makes this his coming out party of 2019 against the rival team and gets the win to put him put the Browns in first place for the division. Assuming you count that as a tiebreaker, we will play them again, but... They'd be in first place of the division, at least tied for it. When we have the opportunity to silence them down to one and three and put them on, on ice, essentially, it could be a disaster if the Ravens aren't ready for, for Baker Mayfield, and they've got to be ready. They've got to be ready. And I think they will be ready. They're not going to shut them down completely, but they're going to do what they have to to contain him, to prevent him from taking control of the game, just like Odell Beckham. Prevent him from taking control of the game. Don't let him get the momentum. Keep the momentum on our side with Lamar. That's what you got to do. That's what they've got to do. Before we wrap up the podcast, we are going to talk about these Cleveland Brown, Browns injuries here. Um, always important to note who you will not be seeing this upcoming Sunday. Um, this I think... I think five, six starters on this injury report, so it's actually not a very good situation for the Browns here. Their secondary is banged up as well. They have some guys missing that they really, 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 really wish they could get back right now for this game. 
Um, and speaking of those two guys, it's Denzel Ward and Greedy Williams. Both did not participate in Thursday's practice in Cleveland. Um, that's not good. Ardarius Taylor, the linebacker, did not... Or he's a limited participant, I'm sorry. Limited participant. Sheldrick Redwine, not a starter. He's a safety, did not participate. Kendall Lamb, offensive, backup offensive tackle, did not participate. Chris Hubbard, the starting offensive tackle, limited participant. Richard Higgins, wide receiver backup, did not participate. Morgan Burnett, the starting safety, didn't participate either. That's a banged up secondary right there. And offensive guard, Joel Batonio, a very good guard actually. Um, limited in practice, he's the starter as well. So they're pretty banged up heading into this. And if you... If you Compare it with the Ravens injury report here. Mark Andrews did not participate. Jimmy Smith did not participate. Brendan Trowick did not participate. Otero Laka did not participate. Jimmy and Mark Andrews are only the really big guys who didn't participate. And I kind of, I mean, I can't say Mark Andrews is going to play this Sunday. But you have that feeling he will. Greedy and Denzel Ward, they didn't play against... Um, Who did they play? The Rams. I'm sorry. I just said that too. The Rams this past week, that whole secondary was, was kind of bonkers. But they had some good players in there. Like They came off the bench to win the game, or almost win the game, because they choked. Uh, they choked. On offense, Baker choked. Um, but against the Ravens with guys like Murray, uh, Marquise Brown, if um, Mark Andrews plays, Hayden Hurst, Miles Boykin, Willie Sneed, these are all guys that they really wish they would have Denzel Ward and their first round pick Greedy Williams for, but they're probably not going to have them. I ha- they're not ruled out yet, but not participating in Thursday's practice. Not very good. And then, of course, you really do want Joel Batonio and Chris Hubbard in there. You know, two losing two offensive starters uh, on the line could be a problem, but they were both limited, so there's a chance to play. And then, of course, Darius Taylor, the linebacker, could play. Morgan Burnett, maybe, maybe not, because he did not participate in Thursday's practice. Well, that's going to wrap up today's episode of Nest Talk, episode 46, again, recorded uh, Thursday night, um, Thursday the 26th. Uh, We will see you next week back on our Friday regular recording schedule. If something happens between now and the morning um, that this is being released, I am so sorry for missing out, but not much I can do about that right now. Uh, Make sure you find us on Twitter at Nest Talk or at Be More Feather. On Twitter, you can find me at Chris Sunfun on Twitter as well. Make sure you like us on Facebook. Just search up the Baltimore Feather or Nest Talk on Facebook. If you are listening on iTunes, subscribe on iTunes. Rate us on iTunes. It helps out a lot. If you're listening on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel and rate us there and give us great comments, great feedback. And again, I want to hear whether or not you think the Ravens right now, based on last week's game against the Kansas City Chiefs, should go out and trade Jalen Ramsey. We had a nice discussion last week in the comments. I want to see if anybody's mind has changed based on what happened in Kansas City. You can find my predictions for the Ravens game, which are not yet formulated against the Browns. I'm kind of hee-hawing this game a little bit. Um, They will be available probably Saturday morning. Hopefully that gets out on time as well. Uh, Preview and predictions that will be. And of course, you will be able to find the film reviews coming out. I I really think they're going to come out next week at this point, but... We'll see. Ravens Retrospective Review on the blog, BaltimoreFeather.com. Subscribe to the newsletter there. It will be in your email inbox as soon as it's published. With that being said, we will see you again for Nest Talk, episode 47, next week on Friday. This is Chris Linfont of the Baltimore Feather signing out.